uh, the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 5. We're just going to take a short break uh, before we get into the Proverbs. The Wednesday service is still not quite done with the Psalms. That Wednesday teacher is so slow. And <laughs> let him finish the Psalms, and then we're going to get into the Proverbs. But today, I'd like us to be in Luke chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. And our message is transformed by the Master. Let's pray and receive from God's Word today. Lord, we are so thankful for your word. We know that you use it in our lives, that you send it with your heart revealed to us, that we would walk in it. So God, we open our heart and say, God, meet us in this place by your Holy Spirit. Show us your glory. Show us the way to live. We open our heart to receive from your word today. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. amen. All right, Luke 5 uh, Jesus is just beginning his uh, public ministry. He's up in the north in the Sea of Galilee area, the far northern uh, tip around Capernaum. And uh, it tells us that Jesus one day is standing by the shoreline and uh, a multitude is pressing around him. He sees two boats lying on the edge of the lake uh, and uh, fishermen are washing their nets, which is to say they're done fishing for the day. So he gets into one of the boats, which is Simon's, and he asks him to put out a little way from the land, and he sat down and began to teach the multitudes. Now, this, this would create a couple of things. One, some distance, so he could speak to everyone. But then also, the water, interestingly, becomes like a natural amplifier. I don't know if you've ever been on the water and noticed that, but it's true, and I remember when uh, the kids and I would go fishing, you know, uh, many years ago, we'd get out there, you know, and you can hear conversations in boats like way over there. Like, do you realize I can hear you? Like, the water does this effect. But more than that, the real point of the story is what happens after Jesus finished teaching the multitude. He turned to Simon and he said, put out the uh, boat into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. And this was an amazing scene that unfolds. This is not to teach Simon some new idea of fishing. Simon fished for a living. This is about making Simon a disciple of Jesus Christ. And that's where uh, we become part of the story. Because God is doing that very thing today. God is still on the move making disciples. Before we read the story, it's, I think, good to step back and say, well, what is a disciple? What exactly does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus Christ? Well, the word uh, originally means one who is learning. But in that context and in the heart of God, it has a much deeper meaning. It means uh, a one who is a disciple is one who is like the master in character, thought, in words, uh, decisions, manner of living. To be transformed by the master. To learn from the master. To find a teacher meant that you would learn to live your life. That his wisdom would become your wisdom. That his character would become your character. His manner of life would be your manner of life. It's more than just learning uh, in a class, I mean, you could take a class and learn how to have a career, but how do you have a life? How do you learn to live your life? That is what Jesus is still doing today, that God's wisdom would become your wisdom. His manner of life would be yours. But another, I think, lesson that comes out of the story is that God loves to use unlikely people. That it gives him tremendous glory to use those that are very unlikely. For example, Jesus there on the northern end of Sea of Galilee is going to invite four people to become disciples, and they're all fishermen. I mean, how unlikely is this? That Jesus is going to turn the world upside down and use simple fishermen? Yes, and then later he's going to invite a tax gatherer, hated, despised sinner, like a tax gatherer. How unlikely is that? God's going to use a sinner, a tax gatherer, despised by the people to turn the world upside down? How unlikely is that? But see, that's where we are part of the story. I mean, who are you? Are you simple and unsophisticated? Good. You're just who God's looking for. 
Notice 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 27 and 29. God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. The base things of the world, the despised God has chosen. The things that are not that he may nullify the things that are so that no man may boast before God. All of us are then qualified if God's looking for people like that. Amen. Let's read the story. Luke chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. <clears throat> it came about that while the disciples, or while the multitude were pressing around him and listening to the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, which is another name for the Sea of Galilee. And he saw two boats lying at the edge of the lake, but the fishermen had gotten out of them and were washing their nets, which is to say they're done fishing for the day. And he had gotten into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little way from the land. And he sat down and began teaching the multitudes from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he then said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered and said, uh, Master, we worked all night and caught nothing. But nevertheless, at your bidding, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a great quantity of fish that their nets began to break. And they signaled to their partners in the other boat for them to come and help them. And they came and filmed both of the boats so that they began to sink. Now when Simon Peter saw this, he fell down at Jesus' feet and he said, depart from me, I am a sinner. I am a sinful man, Lord. For amazement had seized him and his companions because of the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, do not fear. From now on, you will be catching men. You are a fisher of fish. Now you will be a fisher of men. And when they then brought their boats to land, they left everything behind and followed him. They will become disciples of Jesus Christ. Great story filled with a lot of insight for us to take hold of and apply. Notice, starting with this, that disciples respond to God's word. When Jesus told Simon to let down the nets for a catch, at first Simon argued with him, like trying to convince him this is a waste of time. This is, uh, we've been doing this all night. We caught nothing. There are no fish there. Not in this area. There are no fish. And it's the wrong time of day. Especially if you're going to use a net. That's why you fish at night. By the way, whenever we go to Israel, uh, one of the most meaningful experiences, I hope you get to do this with us sometime, we always go to the Sea of Galilee and we take a ride on the Sea of Galilee in a wooden boat. And we turn the worship music on and just it's just one of those beautiful moments you know we are on the sea of galilee and then at some point you know they always stop the boat and one of the crew comes out and he says all right now we're going to catch fish for our dinner because we always have you know we uh, we call it saint peter's fish lunch it's always a thing we always have fish lunch when we're in the sea of galilee area so he says all right now we're going to catch our fish and he, you know, demonstrates how he does it, you know, and he takes a net and he's got lead weights around the perimeter and he throws it, it's a big circle, you know, and it falls and then it sinks and then he pulls the rope, you know. And we've been doing this for years and we've never caught any fish. You know why? Because it's in the middle of the day. That's not when you catch fish. I, I know this personally. Um, many years ago when our kids were young, we would go fishing at Lake Odell. Uh, I used to, research where you can actually catch fish in Oregon and I know they have fish in Odell Lake so we would get there you know and set up our camp and get up in the morning and make our fire and and you know make our coffee and our bacon and get all our coats on and you know our thermoses and our lunch ready and we go down to the lake and start to head out but we're heading out and the other fishermen are just coming back and of course, we don't catch anything. And so I then start talking, hey, why is it you're catching fish and we're not? Because you got to go out and when it's dark. You got to go out at over dark 30. That's when you catch the fish. And of course, we had to get up at over dark 30 the next day. But see, this is uh, uh, the point. 
That's not when you catch fish. But that's the story that changes everything. Because then Simon says, nevertheless, we've been fishing all night, we caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your bidding, at your word, I will do it. I'll let down the nets. See, nevertheless, I will do what you ask. This is a very practical application. For many people have a very independent mindset. They hold on strongly to the idea, you know, that they are like masters of their own destiny. That, that they, they are the ones, you know, that do what they want to do. Many people, when they hear God giving them a direction, they will argue with God, dismiss it out of hand. Look, I worked all night, all right, and I caught nothing. There are no fish, period, end of discussion, issue closed. But when, when Jesus asked Simon to do that which did not make good fishing sense, he was asking Simon to trust the master. It's the point of a disciple to understand, to be willing to attempt the impossible. For if God is in it, then anything is possible. Many people quit way too early. Many people quit at the first sign of an obstacle or their first sign of, of, of why they don't want to do it. And, and many people quit far too early. You can do far more than you can imagine if God is in it. If God is in it, you can do far more than you can possibly imagine. People quit way too early. Amen? Amen. Ephesians 3.20. Now unto him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond. I love that phrase. Far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or even think. According to the power that works within us. You can do far more than you can even think if God is in it. Now Simon did counter Jesus. But then he did what Jesus asked. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the nets. And that's when they then uh, uh, were able to catch such a huge quantity of fish. And of course, the life lesson is that's when life is effective. When you say, nevertheless, I will do at your word what you ask me to do. That's when your life is effective. Because, here's the principle, God blesses faithfulness. This is the principle. It's a theme that we see throughout the Word of God. A true disciple of Jesus Christ must write that principle down on his heart, on your heart. Write it forwards and backwards. Be faithful. It's easy to argue with God, but when you add that one phrase, nevertheless, at your word, I will do what you ask. That changes everything. It takes trust to believe that God will truly do that which he says. Truly, he is not only the Lord, he is your Lord. When you have that attitude of faith, he becomes your Lord. See, this is what Jesus said in Luke chapter 6, verse 46. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? That is the point of calling him Lord. Why do you call me Lord, Lord? And yet, do not do what I say. To, require, uh, to call him Lord, Lord, requires, first of all, humility, because we are so independent-minded. But secondly, it takes faith to believe that God has purpose in what he asks. Logic did not help Simon understand why the Lord wanted the nets cast then. From our perspective, we can step back and see that Jesus was not trying to teach Simon some new fishing technique. He was teaching Simon about faith. He was teaching Simon about the power of God's presence. God's presence changes everything. And that obedience of faith is what makes life effective. That he is the Lord. When you say, Lord, Lord, and then do what he says, that's when the life is effective. I was thinking of an illustration. Some of you are perhaps old enough to remember when the Dallas Cowboys were a good football team. <laughs> Many years ago, they uh, drafted a quarterback by the name of Roger Staubach. Some of you might remember this. Uh, Roger Staubach was a very accomplished quarterback, Heisman Trophy winner, 
and uh, was renowned for his ability to call his own plays. And then he was drafted. The problem is he was drafted by a team that's coached by Tom Landry. Now, some of you might remember that Tom Landry uh, was considered by many to be a genius of football strategy. And Tom Landry personally called every play. Now, you can see where the conflict arises. The result was nothing short of disaster. Roger Staubach said later that he resisted. Like, every time a call would be uh, sent in, he had a better idea. He wanted to do something else. He didn't, he didn't like the fact that these calls were coming into him. He had his own ideas. He has his own plays that he wanted to run, and he didn't like the fact that these plays were coming into him. And he resisted, and he wouldn't do it. You know, he wouldn't put his heart into doing what he was asked to do because he had his own ideas. But gradually, he began to, to, to see, you know, these are pretty good plays that he's sending in. And then he, you know, decided that he's going to try them. And then he decided to put his heart into them. And then next thing you know, winning then came forth out of that relationship where then he trusted that these calls were actually pretty good calls. And then he put in his heart, and the result was, of course, four Super Bowl appearances, two Super Bowl rings. I mean, the result now is famous. It's a great illustration. Because so many people are used to calling their own plays. I call my own plays. I, I'm the one who calls the plays in my life. But the person who has that attitude would be very limited in life. Because I'm here to tell you that God's got way better plays than what we can come up with in our mind. God has better than what we can come with on our own. Anybody believe me? Amen. Sure, let's give the Lord praise. Right, when Simon did as Jesus directed, that's when they enclosed the great quantity of fish and the nets began to break. Jesus was giving Simon a prophetic insight into the effectiveness of obedience. He's going to make him a fisher of men. You are a fisher of fish, I'm going to make you a fisher of men. It's interesting how, how God takes the, the background, the past, and uses it for his glory. You are a fisher of fish. I'm going to use that aspect and make you a fisher of men. Uh, it reminds me of like David. David was a shepherd of sheep. I'm going to take you from shepherding the sheep and I'm going to make you a shepherd of my people. God uses that background into his glorious purpose in the kingdom. And I know that's true. God will use it for you and he's done it in me. I remember, for example, my first job, my first real job after uh, my, you know, experience of picking berries, that was my first job of picking berries. Anybody pick berries when you were young? Today, people don't understand the glory of picking berries, <laughs> of work, you know. But my first real job after picking berries was to be a janitor. And uh, as a janitor, my job was cleaning toilets, and sweeping and mopping. And I don't like to brag, but I'm gonna brag. I am good at mopping. And it just frustrates me when I see people mopping and they're not doing it right. <laughs> but you know, God used, like being a janitor and learning how to clean is actually great preparation for being a pastor. I mean, who knew? Well, God knew. And then I went into working in restaurants and I, I, you know, worked my way up. I became a, a kitchen uh, overseer in the kitchen and the food. And later I became a, a restaurant owner. And then who knew many years later that food would become such a big part of what we do here at Calvary Chapel. And God knew, God uses that into his purpose. And that I was a waiter uh, in restaurants, I was a waiter of tables. Howard Hendricks used to say, very famous professor, that waiting on tables is great preparation for ministry because you gotta learn how to serve. God can use all of the past and use it for his glory. But then we see this in the story, that we must master our own desires. To be a disciple of Jesus Christ means we must master our own desires 
to the obedience of Christ. Simon didn't want to let down the nets. We've been doing it all night. To him, it was a waste of time, but he did it. See, imagine what God might do in the life of someone who is responsive, who will do, who will call him Lord and do what he says out of the obedience of Christ. The scripture is filled with insight into the effectiveness of obedience with Christ. 2 Corinthians 10, 5. We are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Uh, Hebrews 5, 14. Solid food is for them mature who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. I was reading, I was thinking of an illustration, I was reading a story of how they used to train Arabian war horses. I don't know if you've ever seen an Arabian horse. We actually have a family in the church who has two Arabian horses and I've been out there, visited, you know, and uh, these are like big, you know, strong. These are the horses like with rippling muscles on their chest, you know, and they make great war horses. And I was reading a story of how they train these war horses. Of course, they must learn to, uh, uh, to move at every direction of the master. To be effective, they must learn to move at every direction of the master. But they go through all this regimen of training. And then the last one is to test whether they can master their own desires for water. They will put them in a pen. Deprive them of water. Now, they are in sight of water. There's a lake. They can see the water. They can smell the water. But they're hemmed in this pen and deprived of the water. Now, you might say, well, that's kind of a cruel thing to do. Except that this is an essential part of training. In war, water is not always readily available. And they must learn to master their desires. And so they deprive them of the water. After several days, they open the gate. When they open the gate, the result is predictable. The horses charge for the water. And they stand back and let them make the charge. But right before they get to the water, they make the call, they make the signal to halt. Very loud, clear signal to halt. And some of the horses will come to a screeching halt because they learn to obey the voice of the master. And they will come to a screeching halt. Others will ignore and rush into the water to drink their fill. But those who came to a screeching halt, they are the war, so they are the war horses. The rest of them are dismissed. They halt, quivering, longing for that water. But they came to a halt when the master says, halt. And then the master says, come. They must turn away from the water and walk to the master who then leads them to a place where they can drink their fill. But now they're war horses. This is a great story. Reminds me of Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 3. God is speaking to Israel here in the desert. He humbled you and let you be hungry. And then fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you understand that man does not live by bread alone. But man lives by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. This is a great verse. Man does not live by the desires for bread. The desires of for whatever it may be. No, man lives by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. This is a great word. But then notice this in Luke 5. That disciples then know who they are. See, when Simon Peter saw this great catch of fish, he fell at Jesus' feet. Depart from me, I am a sinner. Lord. Depart from me, I am a sinful man. I'm a sinner, Lord. Now, first we understand that Simon was, of course, immature in his faith. He was responding out of his spiritual immaturity. We understand that. And this is a common reaction when a sinner first encounters the Lord. Depart from me, Lord. I'm a sinner. They, they don't sense any worthiness. And they're not worthy. They, their life is a mess. And, and, and they, 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 they push God away. 
Depart from me. I'm a sinner. I'm not worthy of anything. I'm not worthy of love. I'm not worthy of, depart from me. I don't want to hear this Christian stuff. Some say in conviction, you know, change the channel. I don't want to hear this stuff. That is, until you see your sin for what it really truly is. When you see your sin in all of its ugliness, when you're hurting and broken within, within, overwhelmed by the weight of your sin, when your heart is open then to the calling of Jesus, you come rushing to the Lord. When you see the love of God, when you see the heart of God, you come rushing to the Lord. Reminds me of the story of the testimony of Pastor Raul Reese, I don't know if you've ever heard this testimony. It's one of the most powerful testimonies I've ever heard. The story of his background is that he, he was in the Vietnam War and it really messed him up. Just filled with rage, and anger, in the fight, just messed him up. He uh, found a, a, a woman, got her pregnant, they eventually got married, they had two children, but he just could not stop the rage. And one day he came home and he found uh, the house empty, but her bags were packed and he knew right away that she had decided to leave him. So he got a rifle and was waiting for them. He said that he was determined that he was gonna kill them when they came home. And now he's in a real rage and he's smashing everything and throwing everything. He's got his rifle in his hand. And at some point, he, he hits the TV with the butt of the rifle. He hits the TV with the butt of the rifle, and the TV comes on. And who should be on the TV? But Pastor Chuck Smith, with a big smile on his face, talking to Catherine Kuhlman, uh, Kuhlman and a bunch of hippies about the love of God. And about the forgiveness that God offers because of his great love. And there in that moment, Raul Reese lifted up his rifle to shoot the TV. I don't want to hear this. And he began to pull his rifle up to try to shoot it, but he couldn't do it. And he said, there's something about those words that hit home. It was like the arrows of the Almighty hit my heart. And I fell on my knees and I started crying. And he said, God, I'm a sinner. And he started crying like a baby. And he said, God, forgive me. Please forgive me for everything I've ever done against you. And, and he got in his car and went down to the church. Uh, and he's just praying, you know, and he, now he knows that God has forgiven him. He goes down to the church. He's trying to find his wife. He's got to tell his wife, you know, what has happened. Uh, he can't find her. He comes back home. Now she is home. Uh, she's locked the door, so he pounds on the door, and she opens the door, you know, with that chain thing just about that far. She opens the door, and he says, I'm changed. I've been forgiven. I've asked Jesus into my life. She slams the door. She says, I was afraid. I didn't believe him. She says, I put the kids in the, in the back room. And then she opened the door and let him in. And he's explaining to her, the house is a mess. But he's explaining to her what happened. That God met him and he for, God forgave him and he pleaded with God and God did it. She wouldn't believe him. She says, it, it, it took a year before she believed I would see him reading his Bible. He was reading his Bible. I thought it was just for show. And he would pray, but I thought it was just for show. Until I saw that he then started telling all his friends that you need to come to, you need to, come to faith. You need to be forgiven. You're sinners too. And he started bringing his friends. And then he went down to the, the school where he used to go to high school, and he asked the principal if he could speak to the kids. And to his amazement, the principal said yes. So he went down to the cafeteria and he stood on, on a table and he started giving the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then at the end of it, he said to the students, you need to accept the Lord Jesus Christ if you got the guts to do it. He still needed to learn this evangelism thing a little bit. <laughs> a little rough around the edges. But then she says, but then I believed. Then I believed. And the Lord made him a pastor. In fact, one of the most effective gospel uh, uh, ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Raul Reese said later, I was a trophy for Satan. 
until God got a hold of me and I became a trophy for the kingdom of God. God can change my life. Amen. Let's give him <clears throat> praise. Amen. Come running. When you see your sin for what it is, you come running. But then there's a transformation. It's this. Know who you are now in Christ. Know who you are. See, if you can only know who you are in Christ, instead of saying, depart from me, Lord, I'm a sinner, you would say, depart from me, sin, for I am now a disciple of Jesus Christ. Depart from me, sin, because I am now a son or a daughter of the Lord. Simon says, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a sinful man. Do we sin? Yes. There's no one without sin. That's true. But how do you now identify yourself? How do you now identify? Who are you now? You were once a liar or a thief or an indulger or whatever it was. But who are you now? See, when you're in Christ, you have a change of perspective on who you are. The enemy is the one who is the accuser of the brethren, it says, and wants to remind you of the things that you've done that are hurtful and sinful and wants to pin that on you forever. You have done that, and that's what you are. The enemy will want to remind you of all the things you've ever done that were sinful, and will never let you forget it. And that's what he wants to label you as for the rest of your life. The problem is, it's true. You did do those things, and therefore, they don't know how to give an answer. But those who are now in Christ... Know that our eternity is found in him, our hope is found in him, our forgiveness is found in him, our life is found in him, and now our identity is found in him. We are now adopted as sons and daughters of the Lord God Almighty because of what Jesus has done in setting us free from that. Amen? Yeah, let's give the Lord praise. Right. May we know this, may we stand firmly on this truth to know who we are in Christ. Depart from me, sin, I am in Christ. I am made new. In other words, leave the old behind. When they got their boats to the land, it says they left everything behind and followed Jesus. These men were becoming disciples of Jesus Christ. That's the point of where maturity sets in. That's the point of when the old is left behind. Some people can leave the old behind in one wondrous renewing of the heart. Other people can leave the old behind in gradual steps. And maybe it's a little of both. But whatever it is, it is that process by which we are set free from the old. Don't keep carrying the old stuff with you. You're going to get tired of carrying it. Be made new in Christ. Be transformed by the master. Be made new. That which God is doing is a new work. It's glorious. It's beautiful that which God does when you are transformed by the master. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. You are made new in Christ, he says. So walk in that newness of Christ. It's a glorious thing, walk in that glory. It's a beautiful thing, walk in that beauty. It's a transformation that God would do for those who are now walking as disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you made new? Then walk in that newness, he says, and leave the old behind. Be set free from the past and be made new in Christ. Let's pray. Lord, we are so thankful for such great truths as these. That we're no longer who we once were. That we can be set free from the past. Become disciples of Jesus Christ because of who we are now in Christ. God, help us to walk in that, that glorious new work. Church, would you say to the Lord today, make me new. I want to leave the old. 
I don't want to be identified with that anymore. Make me new. God, that which is glorious is beautiful to me. That is who I am. I want to walk in that newness of life that you've given to me as a gift. Make me new. It's the cry of my heart. Leave the past. Leave the old and make me do. Is that your heart, your prayer? Would you just raise your hand as a way of saying to the Lord, that's my prayer, that's my heart. Make me new. Leave the old. Just raise your hand to the Lord if that is your prayer today. God, I want to leave the old behind. I want to be made new in Christ. God, we honor you and thank you for the glory that you poured out to us through your Son. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. Can we give the Lord praise and glory?